it's been a privilege to be able to work through 1 John with you as a congregation, as a church. I hope it is edifying you. I hope it is challenging you. I hope that uh, we're not just gaining the knowledge from the understanding, but we're thinking introspectively of our own lives and how these truths that are presented in 1 John, these marks of the believer, um, aren't necessarily causing undue doubt in our life, but is bearing forth the changes in our lives that we need to make. That we don't just become those that are wise in the word and yet not doers of the word, but that we take the word of God by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and we are indeed sanctified by the word of God. Last Sunday, we started looking at the love of God. We looked at uh, verses 11 down to uh, verse, actually, sorry, from verse 8 down to 11. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And that living through him is at the heart of the gospel, is that which we strive for and desire in our lives. And this morning we want to continue looking at this love of God, that which God has defined, that which God is, that which bears forth from God to us because of his great love for us. And so this morning we want to look at the indwelling love of God, and so we will focus on verses 12 to 14 primarily, and we'll jump around a fair amount, as I'm sure you're used to by now. But 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 to 14, let us read it together. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we humbly come before you. We are humbled in the midst of that which your word testifies about the greatness of who you are. And the fact that if you hadn't chosen out of your divine will to interject into our lives, we would never know you. We are greatly thankful for the love that is defined by you and the love that is from you. The love that sent your son to the cross to bear forth our iniquity, that those who enter in and call upon the name of the Lord would be saved, that they'd be transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives and that they would indeed know, not about, but truly know the love of God. Lord, I pray for clarity here this morning as we look at this magnificent portion of Scripture, as we're challenged by it. Lord, reveal in our hearts the things that need to change. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The love of God is a magnificent topic. It is one that, as we looked at a little bit last week, has been exploited by many. I think we switch or transfer over this idea that love is God rather than God is love. And we think that all we need to do in society is establish love for one another or towards one another. And in that loving attitude and heart and compassion, we therefore will know God. Um, that is a fallacy. Love does not originate in humanity as we will look at and have looked at. But rather it is that which comes from God, defined by God, and therefore the necessity of God. And how far surpassing then a love for or upon is a love that is indwelling. Indeed, the indwelling, transforming love of God. A love that is consuming, a consummate love that is manifested not in just some believers, not in just the real righteous ones, but in all believers, all who come to the cross of Christ 
will know the love of God. We'll know this magnificent love of God. And the greatness of this love of God is that it is not a passive love, but an active love. It's not that which is just out there that is hovering around that we bump into one and now and again. But rather it is this active love of God that is actively working upon those whom he has chosen, that is actively working in this world in a general sense on all humanity. God is a benevolent God. God is a God that loves his creation. And his disposition is for that all, that all. That's sometimes hard for us to understand, but all, even the worst, even the worst that we could possibly drum up in our minds, that all would come to know the love of God. It's in these verses, verse 12 to 14, that John lays forth and explains a wondrous truth of God's love, this love that indwells the heart of the believer. And he does so strategically in these verses. He puts forth, forth this piece of the believer's reality, which understood bears forth glory unto God and praise to his name, the Lord God Almighty, when we truly understand the extent and the magnitude of this love that is indwelling the believer. And so this morning we want to look at four steps to this love, to what John is presenting in these verses, and further, hopefully, grow in awe for God and our understanding of God. And that is, in fact, what the Scriptures should cause us to do. As we grow in the knowledge of God, as we are sanctified by the Word, we should reflectively look at our own lives and realize the desperation that we need for God even the more, not the less. Not as we grow in knowledge doesn't mean there's less need for God, but rather more need for God. Martin Luther, he said, the love of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. What Martin Luther is saying is he's speaking to this aspect of active love and passive love, but as humanity, we, we just seek after that which fulfills our wanton needs and pleasures, and we call that love. And also within our humanity, we cannot manifest anything that is pleasing to God or brings glory to God's name. We can't, in fact, love God rightly without God first loving us. Therefore, God must create this love in us. He must place this in our hearts, and he does so through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the subject this morning is the love of God, obviously, and the resolution of this is the effect that is felt by the work of the Holy Spirit who indwells the heart of the believer, establishing that love in the believer's life. Let us read our passage once again, and we will start from verse 7 this time. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And I have to say that I'm very grateful and thankful for the songs that were chosen this morning. Because the group knows where we are in 1 John, but I don't think they realized the emphasis this morning that was going to be placed upon the holiness of God. And yet, 
All those songs we sang, holy, holy, holy. Right, reminding us of the greatness of his name and even the portion of scripture that, that Caitlin stole from my notes this morning from Psalm 96 that talks about the, the nature of God, the perfect nature, the holiness, the splendid nature, the deserved nature of all honor, glory, and praise. And this is exactly what this passage here this morning is presenting to us in regards to the indwelling love of God. And John does so in verse 12 by making a statement which will also be our first point here this morning. And that point is the unapproachable, inconceivable God. The unapproachable, inconceivable God. And John says, not beating around the bush at all, no one, no one has seen God at any time. He's establishing a reality, a point of truth, a fact, that which can maybe attempted to be contested, but that which would fail. No one has seen God at any time. This is an extremely important point in light of the love of God and understanding the depth and magnitude of the love of God. This statement is indicative, it is fact, but it is pressing into us the separation. The separation of God and man. And we don't like to think about it like this, do we? That God is outside of our scope, outside of our understanding, so much greater than we could possibly ever imagine, that he is the untouchable, he is the inconceivable, he is the unapproachable. This is God. This is God. And this is what John wants us to understand, the immeasurable aspect of God, that he is above and beyond all fathomability. This statement, no one has seen God at any time, is more than the statement, I've, I've never seen the wind, and yet we know the wind and understand the wind. Or maybe I've never seen the queen, but we know of the queen, Eh, we don't want to bring this statement down to that level. That is not what John is saying. John isn't comparing it into the things that we feel or the physical nature. He's speaking in a, in a fullness, a completeness of this understanding. No one has seen God, Theos, the supreme creator, the owner, the sustainer of all things. And Theomahi which is to see or seen, means to look upon or to contemplate. The connotation of this Greek word means to gaze at something and to observe it so intently that you are to interpret it. And John is saying, no one has ever contemplated, gazed at, observed, interpreted God. No one. No one has ever seen him. You might be sitting here thinking, well, I've read in the Old Testament these different appearances. The Lord came before Adam, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Balaam, Joshua, Manoah, the three friends in the fiery furnace. But let me lay that to rest. These are just pictures of the pre-incarnate Christ what theology would call theophanies. Adam, Genesis 2, 18, 3, 8, in the garden as the Lord walked in the garden as he was intimately acquainted with God. Abraham, Genesis 18, 1, verse 22, as the Lord appeared before him. Jacob, Genesis 32, 30, as Jacob wrestles with the Lord. Moses, Exodus 33, 20 to 23 on Mount Sinai. Balaam. Joshua, the Lord stands in his way. Manoah with Samson, three friends, and the fourth appearing as one of the gods, Daniel 3.16. This is not God the Father. This is the pre-incarnate Christ, the Jesus who would be born through the Virgin Mary. 
In fact, if you go to John's gospel and you look at what John says in chapter 4 of his gospel, John says in 4 verse 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is spirit. God is incorporeal. He is not flesh and bones. He is not substance. He is not matter. The Bible references God using anthropomorphic language or language that resonates with our understanding. The hand of God does not literally mean the hand of God. It's figurative. Psalms uses this repeatedly. Proverbs uses this. We see this throughout the scriptures and yet this isn't speaking about God Almighty in a physical sense for God is spirit. And all of this really presents to us the reality that if there is anybody that you've heard of or read about that claims that they have indeed seen God, they are grossly mistaken. And you can tell very quickly that this belief, if held to, is a product of a false belief, a false religion. For within this statement, no one has seen God at any time, really presents to us not only the separability of God, but the holiness of God, and the fact that we can't be in that presence. For as Exodus 33, 20 tells us, that no man can stand in the presence of God's glory, or he would be consumed. You would be obliterated, disintegrate, if you were in your bodies as they are to see God Almighty. In fact, there's some examples of just the magnitude of the holiness of God that we see in the scriptures. Isaiah's vision. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And he says further down, I am ruined. For just seeing a vision. Manoah and his wife, as the, the Spirit of the Lord or the angel of the Lord comes before them to tell them about Samson, their response in Judges 13 22 is, We will surely die. Ezekiel 1 28, in the vision of the throne room of God, the vision of God, just the glory in a vision. Ezekiel fell to his face as a dead man prostrate on the ground. It happened again in chapter 3 verse 23. He fell down on his face and only by the Spirit empowering him was he able to stand in a vision. This statement of John here in 1 John, no one has seen God at any time, is demonstrative of the holiness and the glory of God. And as I said, Isaiah 6, 3, holy, holy, holy. The holiness of God is the only attribute of God that is mentioned three times repetitively in the scripture. We see that of no other attribute of God. Holy, holy, holy is reflective of the triune God. Three times, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But it's also reflective of the magnitude and the importance of the purity and the perfection of God. Isaiah 59 Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear, for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken falsehood. Your tongue mutters wickedness. No one sues righteously and no one pleads honestly. They trust in confusion and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies and from that which is crushed a snake breaks forth. Their webs will not become clothing, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, an act of violence is the hands. Their feet run to evil. It goes on and on and on here through Isaiah 59, declaring humanity, our wickedness. And in fact, in verse 18 to 20 of that chapter, it says, according to their deeds, so will he repay 
wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the coastlands he will make recompense. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. This is the holiness of God. Psalm 96, 9. I read this morning during our worship time, our singing. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 6, you also became Im imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Revelations 4, 8 to 11, again, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The one who sits on the throne. Psalm 51.4 reminds us of the magnitude and the holiness of God. And Paul, writing to Timothy, young Timothy, before he takes on in Ephesus, in Ephesus at the church, he reminds Timothy of this very fact twice. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 17, he says, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And in chapter 6, verse 16, he says, Who alone, speaking of God, possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. John is bearing forth before us here this morning the reality of our state and the reality then of this love that has fallen upon those who put their hope and trust in Jesus. No one has seen God at any time. And it's important for us to understand this because it's this statement that sets forth the importance for Christ coming the importance for the cross of Christ look at verse 14 as he closes out this passage that we're looking at this morning we have seen he says no one has seen in verse 12 but now verse 14 we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world you know, not only should this present before us the importance of the coming Christ, but should it also cause us to reflect upon the rarity of such a thing even happening. In fact, Romans 5 presents the rarity of, of this. It says, you know, one might even think to die for a good man, but to die for an enemy? One who hates? One so awful and evil and yet this God perfect and content in all his glory not needing humanity for glory but fully contented in all aspects of that word existing in all eternity past not only created humanity but sent his son sent his son for what purpose? To atone for our sins. But as well, John 1.18, where it talks about no one has seen God and yet the Son, Jesus Christ, He has explained Him. The revelation of God comes through the Son, Jesus Christ.
For as John 6, 46 tells us that the Son has been with God and knows God. Hebrews 1, 1 further illustrates this, telling us in previous times God spoke through the prophets, but now he has spoken to us through his Son. And in chapter 2, verse 1, it encourages us, because Jesus has come and revealed the Father to us, it says in verse 1, Pay close attention. Pay close attention. Colossians 1.15 tells us that Jesus Christ is the image of God. The revelation of God, His grace is seen in Jesus Christ. And we can know God through Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. That through Jesus Christ, we will be complete, we will be made new, we will be able to stand before him as he is. And in the meantime, we are called to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God through our understanding of Jesus Christ and that which he has revealed to us, that which he's presented in his word, Ephesians 4.15, calls us to this, to grow up into that which is the body of Christ. 2 Peter 3.18, that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Verse 18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. So the first point that John is making here is that God is inconceivable. God is unapproachable. No one has seen God Therefore, to know the love of God and to know about God, we must know the Son. And he goes on in verse 12. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. No one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another. This is the second point, the result of faith, knowing the invisible. Look at verse 9 and 11 of this chapter in 1 John. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. These verses speak of the act of God in our lives, not the act of man towards God. And verse 12, verse 12 here that says, if we love one another, isn't to be understood as an aspect of our works unto God that we may then understand God. If we love one another is a sign of, not a sign towards God abiding in us. For as God transforms us and changes us and comes into the heart of the believer, we produce these things, which is why, as we've looked at before, it is a mark unto salvation. Love for the brothers. If you love one another, God abides in you. And his love, his love is perfected in you. This statement is a descriptive statement rather than a works-based statement. Verse 20 of this chapter says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This, in fact, is a wonderful declaration of faith at work in the heart of the believer through the work of God, through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it's interesting 
that Hebrews 12, verse 14, tells us as believers, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. And then we come to this statement here that says, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And when we look at the church today, the church in general today, we want to divorce any aspects of work or righteous living or law following or obedience. We just want to express whatever we feel love is and that somehow is how we'll relate or know God. And yet this statement itself, if we love one another, God abides in us, brings the two together. That knowing God is in relationship with God, as verse 14 says, by knowing the Son. And through knowing the Son, we know the Father. And in knowing the Father, we will produce these things. And if we don't, we don't know God. We cannot divorce law from love. For the love of God that is perfected in our hearts produces these fruits and these actions in our life. And like Hebrews 12, 14, if we are not pursuant of peace and sanctification, growing in our relationship with God, we cannot know or even see God. The statement, the love of God is perfected in us, perfected is teleuo, which means to be made complete. It's actually where we get the word telescope or telescopic from, actually from even a periscope as you go from one level to the next as you see something more clearly and in completion. And this statement is telling us that God abides in us, and in that abiding of God within us, His love is perfected in us. That this relationship, it's derived, this sanctification is derived through the relationship that we have with God, and God in us, God abides in us. He is with us. That results in this perfected love flowing out from us and changing us. And the meaning of all of this, the meaning of all of this in verse 12 here can be looked at in two ways. First, salvation's fruit. God's love is seen as we know God's love. And it's seen in relation to how God defines love. And we don't have to go there here this morning just for sake of time. But 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8 tells us what love is. Tells us what God's love is. And that love is seen as part of the fruit of salvation, part of the sign of God's abiding in us. Based out of obedience, a desire that is foremost from our heart. But secondly, the perfecting of this love and the abiding of God in us is not only salvation's fruit seen through the love that is produced, but it is the sanctification that encompasses and follows the believer throughout his life, com being completed at the end of the days as he goes to be with his Lord. Look at verse th or chapter 3, sorry, in 1 John, verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Look at verse 18. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Look at verse 23. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. And 4 verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 21. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. Second John. Chapter 1, 5 and 6. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we've had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love. That we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. And Jesus Christ 
in the upper room says to his disciples in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. God has come to us. As well in this verse, there's a statement of assured progression. Assured progression of our sanctification. And as verse 2 and 3 say of chapter 3, when he appears, we will be like him. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 speaks of this progressive nature of this sanctification and Hebrews 10, 14 as well talks about those who are sanctified and it's not by mistake that that word can also be interpreted as being sanctified because both aspects are the intent of the writer that we have been justified that we have been freed from the penalty of sin and that we are being freed over the power of sin. And this is assurance to the believer that if we love one another, God abides in us. And because he abides in us, his love is perfected in us. It's that which we can see, that which we can know. Third point here this morning. The indwelling spirit's testimony. Look at verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. This is a wonderful verse because it speaks of an abiding union that we have with Christ or through Christ with God. By this we know that we abide in Him. We know that we abide in Him and He in us. The assurance and the testimony of this in our lives by the actions of the love that is manifested in us by God, by the Spirit that resides in us. This reciprocal understanding, this mutual relationship, this further knowledge that is embedded within us of the knowledge of the unseen God. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. The change in action, that which was spoken of in verse 12, we now will know by our actions because the Spirit testifies on behalf. The Spirit is in us. The Spirit is changing us. We have been transformed, regenerated. We are no longer a clanging cymbal or a noisy gong when it comes to love. It is legitimate. It is real. It's not just an empty knowledge. We know. We know because he has given us the Holy Spirit, this marvelous gift. That which was promised in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in later days, and that which was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. As Peter preaches to the Jewish people, calling them to repentance, reminding them of the Holy Spirit that has come upon them, it is not an act of drunkenness, but the Holy Spirit that is now indwelling them, just as promised, that can indwell them as well. And in fact, in verse 38 and 39, he calls them. He calls them to repent and believe in the name of the Lord and to receive the Holy Spirit as a testimony of the work that has taken place within us. And just a few notes about this verse as well. Verse 13 says, He has given us of His Spirit. This is again in the indicative. This is a statement of fact. It's not a negotiable thing. It's not a debatable thing. And it's in the perfect tense given. Which means you have it and it will continue. 
If it was just in the present tense, it would say, well, the Holy Spirit abides with you, but maybe you can lose him. The perfect tense means you have the Holy Spirit and you will continue to have the Holy Spirit. If you've truly accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have received the Holy Spirit and you cannot lose that. The wording in the text does not allow for that possibility. He has given us of another marvelous short little word out of from God this speaks of the spiration of the Holy Spirit who eternally proceeds from the Father and from the Son to the believer it's how we know God the Holy Spirit who is God proceeding forth from the Father to the believer into his heart as a testimony that we may know that we may know that we have relationship. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 to 3 speaks of the attributes of the Holy Spirit. That he is indeed fully God. Gives us a list of them there. John 14, 16 to 26 speaks again of the Holy Spirit who is to come. That he will be present in your life. That he will comfort. That he will help. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 16 speaks of the indwelling Holy Spirit who brings understanding and knowledge and sanctification to the believer. And Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 testifies boldly that the Holy Spirit has sealed you, has sealed you in relationship as a pledge, that which will be fulfilled when you are in glory for all eternity. This is the indwelling spirit's testimony. The Christian life is not a work apart from Christ, but one in union with Christ by the work of the Spirit unto the Father. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. Isn't this good stuff? This is really good stuff. And it just gets better because it comes to the culmination of all of it here in verse 14. And remember this portion in light of this chapter. In light of this chapter, this emphasis of the love of God, the emphasis of those who are children of God, the reminder in verse 12 that we have not seen God at any time and it's only by the grace of God that we can know God and He abides in us through the work of Christ on the cross and the transformational work of regeneration by the Holy Spirit in us. And it brings us to verse 14, which is the last point here this morning, which is our access in Christ. Look what John says. We have seen. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The culmination of all of this sits in the giver, the gift, and the indwelling relationship. We have seen as a testimony to the authority of John and the disciples, the apostles. We have seen as not only a testimony to the authority, but the authenticity. He doesn't say, well, others saw. It's not secondhand information. We saw. We saw, and John expresses this very clearly in chapter 1 as he says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And it's these things, he says, that they've gone on to write within this letter, within his gospel, 
the authority and the authenticity we have seen and we not only have seen but we testify the proclamation of the truth that which sets you free that which you can find assurance in that which you can know and remember the nature of this epistle it's during the Gnostics that message that you cannot know that there is this hidden secret knowledge that God is just this mysterious entity he only appeared to be Christ you can't know and John reminds us once again by this we know by saying in verse 14 we have seen and testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world and ultimately he's reminding us of the gospel the great divine interjection of God into this world the undeserved interjection of God into this world that though we were sinners Though we were astray, though we were apart from God, though there was no imaginable way that we could know God, for God is unseen, nobody has seen God at any time, He is unapproachable, He is inconceivable, though all these things, the Son of God was born of the Virgin. The Son of God was born of the Virgin, grew up, taught, called men to His side, went to the cross to take all our sins died on that cross was buried and on the third day resurrected ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of God to mediate on our behalf to intercede that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and in that salvation will know the unknowable will know God it's a reminder of the finished work of Christ John records in his gospel in the high priestly prayer of Christ John 17 Verse 25, he says, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these, his disciples, have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known. So that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them this is the indwelling love of God no one has seen God at any time if we love one another God abides in us and his love is perfected in us by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit for we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And so the question that I don't want to ask just flippantly to you here this morning, and I truly want you to ask yourself, do you know the love of God? Does the Spirit of God abide in you? Do you know the Gospel? Do you truly know the gospel? Not just that there was a guy named Jesus died on a cross for our sins and I said some words about that once. Do you truly know God? Because outside of the cross, outside of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, God is unknowable. Sure, creation testifies to the reality of God, that there must be a God. But we can't know that God. We can't see that God. We can't be in union with that God. We can't grow in relationship with that God, and we can't know 
the love of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the sureness of your word, the testimony of your word. And Lord, I thank you for the magnificence of this passage that we looked at here this morning. The fact that no one has seen God at any time and nobody can see God. And yet, in that separation, you sent your Son solely because of your perfect love, your perfect will, that which you always had ordained and planned for. Not out of necessity, but to further bring glory and honor to your name. And you interjected into our lives that we may know that love as well. What a glorious gift. What a glorious gift. May we seek to know that gift. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody here this morning that does not have a relationship with you, that you would convict their heart, that you would draw them to your side, that they indeed would know their sinfulness and that they would call on the name of the Lord, he who saves and redeems, that they too may know the love of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.